This week on Digital Music Trends, a thorough look at the Asian music market with the team of Valley Arm Digital and Music Weekly Asia in Singapore, Manila and Melbourne. Stay tuned for the latest trends in the region and commentary on music matters. So this is a Digital Music Trends, episode 134, recorded on the 29th of May 2013. So hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends, the weekly show where we talk about the latest news in the music tech industry. And DMT is available on many channels, including iTunes, most podcasters, YouTube, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Mixcloud, and many more. Uh, so this week on the show, I'm really happy to welcome all the way from uh, Singapore, Marie uh, Verest. Uh, she's a Digital Project Manager at Music Services Asia. Uh, so hi Marie and thanks for joining us. How's it going? Hello, I'm fine, thank you. Great, awesome. And uh, also we have uh, Neil Cartwright uh, from uh, Manila. Uh, he's a Global Sales and Strategy Manager of Valley Arm Digital as well as founder of Million Media. Uh, uh, hi Neil, how's it going? Going very well, going very well and just uh, thankful that this uh, hotel connection actually works against all the odds. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, uh, also uh, we have uh, uh, Matt uh, Campbell, uh, who is uh, the head of uh, multimedia and content at the Valley Arm. So hi, Matt. Uh, and uh, you are based in? I'm in Melbourne, Australia. Oh, great. So well, thanks so much even, for joining even us. Even further away. So, yeah, I know, no exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, uh, uh, on the video front, it's a slightly challenging show if you're, if you're watching the show. Uh, but if you listen to the show, that shouldn't make a difference. So that's great. But uh, we're based in like uh, four different time zones or yeah, three different time zones. So that's, uh, it's awesome that uh, you guys managed to make it. So uh, essentially this week, uh, uh, we're going to uh, not look at uh, the usual uh, news that we would look on on the show, but we're going to look at some of the news coming out of the uh, Asia market and look at uh, some of uh, what happened at Music Matters in Singapore last week, uh, just to discuss some of the issues that are uh, relevant to, to that part of the world. I mean, uh, uh, this all came up from a couple of the shows where I was talking about issues that uh, relevant to the Asia market, especially you know China and uh, and Singapore and Australia, and uh, really realizing that. Uh, uh, not, nobody in the panel really knew a great deal about it, so I, I think it's great to have you, to have you guys on and uh, and talk about uh, you know a bit more in depth about some of the issues that that are uh, that are happening over there. So first of all, I wanted to start by asking uh, uh, asking you guys what Music Weekly Asia is, uh, just so listeners at home can get a bit of a sense of what you do and sort of uh, uh, how how the project got started. So Marie, do you want to take that first? Yeah, sure. Um, so it started uh, two years ago with the Music Services Asia implementing in Singapore. So it's a sister company of Valeam. Uh, Valeam is a digital aggregator uh, specific, uh, in um, uh, Pacific Asia. Yeah. So Music Services Asia is more the a marketing arm. And so we have different projects, but one of these is uh, Music Weekly Asia. Uh, so it started more like a some news that we posted regularly on the website and yeah. then it shifted to a real website as a, a magazine online. Uh, so we focus on, uh, on music news uh, in the Southeast Asian area. So it's so it, there's some digital news as uh, business news, but uh, our main focus is more uh, B2C, so interviews of artists, uh, news about the concerts going on, yeah. uh, profiles of artists, and discussions about like what's what's happening in the region. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. Absolutely, and the way you you organize, you have uh, you know uh, writers and, and people in different in different territories. So uh, so how, how how does that work? Of course, it's it's pretty hard to be spread out like that. Uh, yeah, we have a, um, a small team of, uh, of um, full-time writers um, in uh, so so here in Singapore, in uh, Manila, and also yeah. in Australia. Uh, we also have some uh, some people that that writes from time to time uh, for us. So it's 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 I have to to juggle between like the everyone's aspirations so yeah. for the the part-time ones is more like oh, I know that you like rock so would you like to to go to this gig and, and review it yeah. and so it's yeah it's, it's more have to have a fluent like like content that comes regularly and uh, interesting news so yeah I mean it's a, it's an editor's job so I mean, it's, it's, it's it's very interesting because there's so much going on and uh, it's yeah. the, the sp it's really speeding up, so um, yeah, it's, it's, it's something to 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 manage. It's really challenging, but very yeah. interesting. Yeah, of course, and uh, a big part of the challenge as well uh, is uh, to do with the languages as well, because of course, uh, Neil, you're you're in Manila now, so uh, you know, of course, 
where, where you are uh, as opposed to for for example singapore or looking at uh, you know korea or or or, or china it's, it's a totally different ball game as far as languages are concerned uh, so h how do you keep up to date with with what's happening in the news uh, given the language barrier Again, that's 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 really where people's people have a lot of misconceptions about the territory because yeah. English is is very very widely spoken in the Philippines. Um, Philippines was a was a was an American or a colony really up until the Second World War. So everybody here speaks uh, incredibly good English. Within the Philippines itself, though, there are three islands and they all speak different different languages on each island so it's it's english that really uh, binds them all together then singapore um english is very widely spoken of course um, i've just come back from thailand and, and i was able to talk very uh, with with everybody there so yeah you, you, yeah there are other things, uh, um, we, were, we live in a world where english seems to be uh, most popular simply because it's it's the language of, of online now, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely, and and as as you're saying, you know, a lot of misconceptions probably as as to how hard it might be to uh, to actually uh, do business with uh, with some of these countries because people are not really sure what the what the level of English is and and how how hard it, it would be. Yeah, absolutely right. Yeah, absolutely. And so, uh, you know, uh, let's start about talking about figures. Uh, you know, the, the company, uh, you know, Music Weekly Asia launched uh, recently a, a new chart service that is going to be covering Southeast Asia. Uh, and uh, that's a very interesting proposition because, of course, you start with Singapore, but then you're planning to expand to countries like the Philippines, Laos, Malaysia and Cambodia. Uh, so what was the inspiration to start a service uh, in, in the region and how important is it to have a chart that, that covers uh, these countries? Uh, yeah, look, look, it's definitely something that didn't really officially exist, um, and we we sort of pitched the idea out there and, and got a lot of support from a lot of Singapore government, this, that, and the other. So, yeah. look, it's 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 look, look like any any charts. It's it's quite easy to it's a, it's it's an easy idea. It's just pulling the data and and um, and yeah. being able to make a, a legit type of chart, but. Uh, um, Look, it's just been very well accepted so far. It's very new. I mean, behind the scenes, we've probably spent the best half of, or best part of, eighteen months to two years just getting it right. Yeah. Um. And, and it's kind of look. It's it's been an exciting time. But as that's been happening, also new platforms have started to exist in the region too. So it's 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 sort of. Streaming's come a lot, uh, a long way. Uh, iTunes has sort of uh, has come into the area. So there's sort of all the, been these other things that have, have, have come along the way with us as we've been trying to put this thing together. It's, of course. Um, it's a, hmm. And uh, Matt, of course, uh, like uh, in the UK or you know in in the US, there are bodies that are you know given the task to do the count to actually okay. produce that. Uh, and so of course uh, that might not be the case in some of the territories that you're looking at. At uh, working in, so uh, how do you how do you how are you pulling the data to get a chart together? Yeah, okay. Well, yeah, you're exactly right there. I mean, look, as an example, the charts here in Australia, which are called Aria. I mean, behind the scenes, it's very much driven by the major record companies here, and and, and always has been. But look, you know, as far as pulling the data, because. Um, we really want to be sort of up to date. We want to we want to not only download uh, uh, data but also streaming data because it's um, it's really kicking in. So, but we put the feelers out. Some some of the uh, some of the platforms make the data very easy to to access yeah. um, via RS feeds um, and all sorts of things. Some just like to sort of play the game a little bit and wonder what you're doing first, and then they'll allow you access. But uh, you know, we've found that the more the more this we, we mentioned the charts, the the stores are sort of coming forward now and offering offering the data. And look, really, the more the merrier. I think in the physical world, a lot of the charts are made up, or particularly in Australia, anyway. It's not so much your major chain stores or anything. Is I mean that there is that, but it's also your your independent tiny little stores submitting their their sales data. So we're trying to do the same sort of thing in the physical, uh, sorry, in the digital world, and yep. um, and give everyone uh, you know make make it fair, I guess. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, talking about uh, streaming services, uh, um, I wanted to. 
uh, briefly uh, mention the fact that, for example, at Music Matters last week in Singapore, uh, the CEO of Deezer, uh, Axel Doshe, talked about uh, the company's strategy in, in the region. So Deezer has launched in a number of territories, including Laos, Thailand, Singapore, Malaysia, and many more. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, he stressed the importance of, uh, uh, you know, making B2B deals and providing local content for, uh, you know, for, for the specific territories. So let's look at some of the hurdles that streaming is facing. So first of all, adoption-wise, uh, you know, how crucial are carriers, for example, to adoption, and how crucial are price points? Because, of because of course, uh, in in that area, uh, you know, different countries have widely different uh, economic uh, you know outlooks, and you know, uh, people are earning uh, widely different mm. wages. So, how do you establish a, a right price point, and what's the best way to distribute this content? And, and Neil, I guess from the Philippines, that's uh, that's an interesting uh, perspective. Well, I had a meeting with the, the head of the largest independent label in the Philippines just now who told me that uh, price was extremely important. The, yeah. the fact is that you know, the, a lot of countries out here are, are developing and that means there is a, a small number of uh, relatively wealthy people who tend to be the ones with access to computers um, and smartphones and then there is the vast majority who uh, don't have those things, you know. And um, but that so if you want to, if you look at a country like Indonesia and think that it's 300 million uh, potential subscribers, then then wow. that's not the case. You know, yeah. there's actually a far smaller number of people who have access to the money and the technology. Now. Um, the, the the services that are, are big, there was a service in Thailand that's been launched by um, a company called Platinum, who were an independent label. Yeah. Um, they've done deals with the majors. They've included all the local Thai content, including from their competitor, competitors, yeah. um, and they've gone out to three dollars a month. So they they priced it as, as low as three dollars. Uh, Melon, which is the largest distributor in Korea, uh, that service was two ninety nine, two dollars ninety nine, and it's rising up to six. Um, Savan in India um, is two dollars a month. Yeah. So the prices are a lot lower, um, but uh, that's that's in order to appeal to the. Uh, to try and get beyond the small number of, of people who could afford the ten pounds a month, which uh, is 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 way beyond the means of the vast majority of people who live here. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Marie, uh, you know, from uh, Music Matters, did you feel like there was uh, some uh, concern uh, in regards to price points? Because of course, everybody is uh, talking in broad strokes about how important the region is, and you know how how exciting the growth uh, in places like India, for example, is. But uh, uh, did you feel like there is a particular concern about price points as well? I didn't hear so much about that in the conversations, but it's true that uh, it's important to to see if it's the mass or the masses or the the richer people that you want to target. Yeah. Uh, but the the thing is uh, because you mentioned bundles, and I think it's a uh, it's quite interesting for the services to enter market because here in the region, streaming services are I mean streaming is something that people don't know about, so it's it's about education as well. Yeah. So maybe like if 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 they enter through a bundle with a telco, for example, it's easier for the people. It's already on the phone, so there's nothing to, to really worry about. It's just like directly accessed. Yeah. But uh, education is, is really important. Because when you talk about like streaming to people, they're like, is it legal or how is it working? How do you access so many tracks? Do you download? And so it's, it's a concept that's not well known here. Absolutely. And, and Matt, uh, I, I guess uh, one of the big points as well is to try and get as much local content as possible into these services, because of course, if you don't make them relevant to the country where you're in, then it becomes a very hard sell to get people on board. And uh, uh, I think aside from Singapore, for example, where you know the majority of the chart is driven by US acts, I would imagine that in, in different territories, the story would be uh, completely uh, you know the opposite, where the majority of, uh, of acts would be uh, homegrown. So uh, do you think that Companies uh, that are coming from uh, the Western, uh, you know, world are making enough effort to bring in local content into the into the picture. 
Yeah, look, yes and no. Look, I don't think the majors are, are, are doing a, a, an amazing job of that, but, um, you know, because, I mean, they've all got their offices over there and it just depends on, on what's on the radar as far as release. But, look, it is very important that that happens because you, you, you're dead right in saying that um, you, you look at the Singapore, you know, top 30 and it's 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 very much US driven. But, you know, the, the, some of these other ter- territories are, are the opposite. So you, you've really got to, um, you, you can't just give them a huge catalogue of uh, Western content and, and hope it's going to work because it's, it's not the case. I mean, you know, obviously some, some of the big ones they may have heard of, but you've, you've got to play it smart. And look, some things work. So, you know, some territories, it may be jazz that works. It may be classical that works. It could be world music. So you've really got to do a lot of research and be smart about it. And, um, you know, you just, like I said, you just can't put it out there and, and expect it to sell. Yeah. I could expand on that. Um, Absolutely, yeah. Um, yeah, going then going back to what I was saying before about the, the the big discrepancy between the sort of the the rich and the not so rich. Um, yeah, it, 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 the 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 vast majority of people here, you know, don't have access to all of the media that we take for granted. We, we take for, you know, we we watch we watch TVs and read magazines and listen to radio and we hear Western music um, yeah, is is pumped out at us all day. But they, they, that is not the case here. You know, the, 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 the huge millions and millions of people here um, really listen to, to local music. I've been listening to the radio that um, all the taxi drivers play here, you know, and it's, it's predominantly local music. Um, the, the, the music they play in clubs and bars is, is a mixture of um, some Western, but uh, there's, a, there's a huge amount of local content being played. So in answer to your question, are the services doing enough to get local music? No, they're not. They're, they're, they absolutely need, must have local content if they want to appeal to the local populations. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, that, that's that's fine. And of course, you know, if you look at a service like Deezer, for example, they expanded so quickly as well that it's hard to see them being able to actually uh, granularly pick out the best content from all the territories well, that they're in. There's, there's two problems there, and I've just been talking to. Um, we've got an office here, obviously. Uh, I've been talking to the to the guys here about Deezer um, because it's launched, and they say that that's the number one problem they've got with the service is is that it doesn't have a it doesn't have the local content, yeah. and mm. b lot of the best content is a, you know, it's not available in in the Philippine territory. Yeah. So again, that's the that's the major record. Or like, okay, it's it's not all the majors. You know, there are licensing issues. So they may license the track for Europe or uh, Western Europe, but they don't have the rights in in South mm-hmm. Asia. So they've got to come and get those rights. So actually, the the catalog on Deza in this territory is at least they. Yeah. So uh, uh, it definitely has to be worked on. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. And so, and so, uh, looking at, uh, for example, uh, S- Singapore is an interesting place, but just because it feels like it's a really, it's a hub for a lot of uh, digital music services that are looking to set up shop in the, in the area. I know Marie was mentioning the fact that uh, you know, uh, I believe Digital are, are planning to open a open a, an office there, and the Orchard has a small base there. Mm. So a lot of uh, digital distributors as well on the independent front are planning to to have a presence in the region. So uh, why do you think Singapore is so conducive to uh, people setting up shop there? Is this simply because of the language issue, or is are there other, uh, you know, reasons why people would want to set up business in Singapore for uh, a, a music, music-oriented uh, service, Marie? Um, I think Singapore is really keen on uh, welcoming new companies, and and it's it's a really good hub geographically speaking. Because if you see Hong Kong, Hong Kong is really towards Taiwan. Or China, but Singapore, we are really in the center of this area, so I think it's, it's easy as a, I mean, very developed base uh, to to begin with, and then and spread out in the different countries as local offices. I guess it's uh, an easy option, and I also think that uh, tax-wise, it's interesting to be in Singapore. So I mean, it has a like a, 
different things that help uh, companies to set up first in Singapore. There's a lot of, of uh, all the marketing and uh, ad advertising companies that, are, that have their uh, headquarters, uh, Asian, a Asian headquarters in Singapore as well. And a lot of big companies, international companies are also here. Yeah. Uh, well, one of the markets that are most... Uh you know, misrepresented and really uh, little understood is China. And uh, we were talking a few weks ago about, uh, you know, the, the Taobao uh, acquisition of the service Xiaomi and its implementation uh, uh, within the website, uh, as well as the licensing issues that go with that, because uh, Xiaomi has some licenses, but apparently not all licenses. Uh, and uh, and also, you know, there, there are a lot of people talking about the market. So, for example, the IFPI's uh, Francis Moore uh, stated at Music Matters that in China we're seeing a new approach uh, approach to licensing uh, as record companies partner with internet companies such as Baidu. Uh, you know, these deals aim to lay the foundations for a licensed digital business. And so more partnerships are expected and, and, and the market is expected to, to uh, progress also because there has been a bit of a turnaround uh, in terms of uh, the way that the Chinese government is looking at copyright administration and uh, uh, they are actually classing music downloads or paid for music downloads as in inevitable now whilst a few years ago this wasn't even on the radar at all for the government so mm. uh, do you think that china is a, a viable high growth market for the music industry as it has been touted for a few years now or is there still uh, way too much work to be done also in the education side for for that to become true neil uh, any ideas on that we're, well, we're starting to see signs that it can be monetized. Um, the the progress is fairly slow, although it is uh, it, it it's it, it has sped up over the last well, six twelve months. Yeah. And in fact, the the situation is changing um, you know, virtually every day with services saying that they they will start paying. It's very much based on an advertising model, though. So. Before anyone thinks that they get there's vast amounts of money, it's the, you, you got to bear in mind that the the advertising revenue on the sites is is relatively low, um, albeit there's there's high volumes. Um, a couple of caveats: one being for the, the the sort of the rich and poor. Um, it's it's the same in China, obviously. Um, so the number of people who can afford or uh, computers uh, and smartphones is is, uh, is is not the the full population. Of course. Um, and 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 again, it's local content, um, very much local content. I'm speaking on a number of occasions with our, uh, we've got two representatives in Beijing, um, asking them about various types of music. And they say that you know that in the cities, in the cities, you've, you know, people do know who <laughs> Justin Bieber is, and they do know who Britney Spears is. But if you go outside of the cities, um, and 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 it's also not all cities. They say yeah. there's um, there's a big difference between the the major cities, Shanghai, Beijing, um, and the and and everywhere else, which is you know, Beijing, Beijing and Shanghai might make up uh, one percent of the population. That leaves ninety-nine percent of the population who don't have a clue. Just in Beijing, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. That's that's, that's right. And uh, and so uh, you know, looking at uh, you know, China is an interesting example of uh, of a market that hopefully will. Uh, pick up in the in the next few months, uh, but uh, you know we've been talking about streaming it quite a bit. But there's also a, a huge component in uh, uh, downloads still because uh, of course the market never really matured in a lot of these territories, and so there might be an opportunity for downloads to actually. Uh, you know, start playing a bigger role uh, even before streaming picks up because, of course, there's a huge amount of education to be done on that front before it becomes something that people really understand. So, uh, Matt, do you feel like uh, there is a, a big potential for downloads to, to grow in, in the region? Yeah, I think so. I mean, a lot of people still like to own, you know, own the audio, whether it's on a handset or on their computer, and, and um, that's always going to be there. I think uh, uh, look, iTunes has been now pretty, um, pretty brutal, and they'll they'll go in hard, and they'll they'll try hard to keep that afloat. But, but I think so, look, definitely. I think most. I mean, look, a lot of people I know, particularly, and probably even myself, they they do have their Spotify accounts or whatever, but they they 
generally do like to own the audio and, and purchase that, and it's then it's on it's in their system, and I think that'll that'll be around for a long time. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, look, streaming is even in Australia here. Streaming really only kicked in maybe eighteen months ago, max. It was very talked about. Um, there were a few platforms um, who sort of copied the Spotify model um, even before Spotify had launched here, and, and you know, very soon after Spotify did launch, and to, to their horror, because they were they were mortified yeah. that um, they were able to walk in with the brand and 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 the a catalog that size and sort of walk all over it. But look, you know, so far here in Australia, the download. Is, is very much uh, what people are into. Um, but we've seen us, we definitely have seen a little slump in, in, in download uh, sales from, from platforms like uh, iTunes. That's a little bit to do with everyone sort of moving over to the streaming thing and a lot to do with people trying out their, their free month or whatever and, you know, not, not, not in the download stores. But, um, you know, look, it'll be an interesting next six months, I'd say. Um, and, Matt, I wanted to ask you about the Australian market just because I'd been quite. Uh, puzzled by by it in the last uh, few months just because I've seen so many streaming services launch in Australia. I think I was mm -hmm. counting uh, a few weeks ago and I think I had counted like eight or nine different streaming services. And then I looked at the yeah. population of Australia and I was kind of thinking, you know, as as big <laughs> as big as a, a market that this could be, you know, uh, but it feels like there are way too many. And you know, there's even like some homegrown services. The one that launched quite recently, and uh, as well as uh, yeah. another one like Guvera that that was there for, for yeah. quite a long time yeah. before that. Uh, on top That's of wrong. all the of all the of all the ones from Europe and and the US that I have launched in, in in Australia as well. So do you yeah. feel like there's a bit yeah. of an oversaturation of services right now for the amount yeah, of people that might be interested? I'd, 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 that's a it's a very safe thing to say because look they they, they all, all are getting very competitive and I think look you know people get excited about these platforms and sort of any any sort of IT group or whatever that's got a bit of money will will try it on um, and yeah look they definitely come to us looking for the for the content but uh, look it's yeah it, it's very fierce at the moment uh, look I think some will stay around some some you can sort of see won't last too long um, I mean it's very odd you, you mentioned and Gavira, and they, they've actually been around for about three years now, and they had a, a very different model uh, to any of these because it was a, it is a downloading site, but um, but you know it's sort of supported by um, corporate advertising, so the royalties and the, and the mechanicals are going back to the artist, but not from the consumer, which is quite a, a bizarre uh, model. Um, yeah. Yeah, sure. They've sort of had to reinvent themselves, and I think that's because, like you say, the streaming uh, platforms are popping up everywhere. So they've sort of slightly, uh, you know, sort of re reshaped the whole company. And also, yeah. look, so, some of the download companies as well are, are, are doing both now. It's it's pretty it's pretty funny to watch, to be honest. And it'll yeah. be again, it's going to be interesting next twelve months just to see who comes out on top. But but I think uh, Spotify definitely coming in with the brand and 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 a pretty happening catalogue are kind of stealing the show yeah. and um, you know Deezer's around but it's yeah, we'll see how it all pans out. Yeah, absolutely. And Neil, I want to ask you about advertising because uh, you were talking about advertising. Know, based services in a lot of the developing con uh, territories, of course, uh, so that they are uh, at least to a degree uh, free to access. Uh, and uh, you know, we we all talk about. Of course, in Europe and in North America, about you know the importance of uh, uh, Google's metadata and you know how much information they have about you as a person, and also Facebook, uh, the same thing. You know how much information they're gathering about you. Uh, but of course, if uh, you know if you look at different uh, territories where Google doesn't have such a stronghold and where Facebook doesn't have such a stronghold, then that is left to other, uh, for example, social networks or search engines that. Uh, might operate on a different uh, level. So, uh, are, are these searches, like for example, Baidu in China uh, or others in other territories, uh, gathering the same sort of data, as far as you know, and kind of can cater to advertisers in the same way as, as Google, for example? Uh, well, I certainly don't think that they're at the, the sort of technological level that Google and Facebook are, but they have a very good knack of being able to copy. Um, what is being done. So, for an example, um, YouTube is, is, is banned in China, but they have an equivalent called Youku. Um, now, if you look at Youku, um, you could be forgiven for thinking that you were looking at YouTube. Um, it's such a, 
uh, it's such a clone of the site, um, and that's that's their equivalent. Uh, they do have advertising on it. They collect the data in the same way. Uh, they have their their own social networks. Um, Baidu is more of a portal than a search engine. Yeah. Um, it's it's more like the a major portal a few years ago. It's um, it allows you to drill down into various categories um, to find what you're looking for. Um, so they, 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 they do have some extraordinarily good copies. However, um, I think it's also worth pointing out that across the entire region, um, Facebook, Google, and uh, in particular YouTube are very, very strong. YouTube in particular is as strong in countries like Korea, uh, the Philippines, um, I know it's popular in Singapore. Uh, the, 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 the kids are watching music videos on YouTube in, in all those countries in exactly the same way as they are in Western Europe and in the States. Absolutely, and and um, Marie, I was I was going to touch touch about uh, touch upon uh, YouTube as sort of the great unifier, uh, you know, aside of course from China where the service is not available, but uh, anywhere else it can be seen as a bit of a great unifier, also uh, culturally and also a, a way that uh, you know, a service that can spread uh, virally videos faster than uh, anything anything else of course we've seen that with uh, with Sai and we've seen it with uh, with a number of other viral videos that have happened and uh, um, as part of the music matters uh, there was also a social star awards which was all about you know sort of social stars and and sort of YouTube uh, sensations and, and all that side of things that, that are very relevant to the Asian market as well uh, so how did you see that pan out and and do you feel like uh, YouTube can actually be the best driver for uh, Asian acts that want to break into into the Western world. Mm, the so for Music Matters, uh, the the YouTube part was YouTube Fan Fest, and the right. Social Star Awards was a, a different organization. It's organized by Star Count, but it's All true right. that they sh they shared some uh, some of the acts. All right. Uh, yeah. So so the I went to both and. It was quite interesting to see how, how these uh, YouTube stars are really stars and how they, they really drive the public. Yeah. So it was a, like a lot of groupies just like coming and screaming at, at, at them as if, I mean, as normal stars in, in, a, in a way. So um, it's like having the Social Stars Award is, is, is to, um, yeah, to give awards to these, these people that are famous only on the internet. Yeah. So, that, so there's having this as a now a new institution, uh, it shifts a little bit because it's not only like giving the Oscars or giving the some awards like for physical things. It's only virtual world, and yeah, I think spreading spreading the like different content and and now also that YouTube uh, also gives the possibility to monetize this, and it's it. Yeah, it gives another dimension, and uh, and and as Neil was saying, accessibility uh, is is important, and and every I mean in Singapore is like there's a lot of cell phones, of course, and uh, like the the new gadgets, everybody has a an iPad or a tablet uh, on top of the the iPhone, and people are accessing YouTube all the time, and and uh, video con content is even more important than music itself itself. Yeah. And and people are also watching a lot of, uh, of of music videos and a lot of TV shows online directly. So yeah, I don't I don't really know how how what, what we what what's the future for this, but it's yeah. it's truly important and it, it will grow for sure. And and yeah, there's also a, like money involved. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Matt, talking about the live sector, so I'm quite interested in looking at, you know, uh, you know, I was covering uh, the the new Detour service by Songkick that is launched launched here in London, where uh, fans can request a gig by a specific artist uh, in 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 London for now. But that's that's uh, uh, poised to launch, uh, you know, in other cities as well uh, in the next uh, mm. months and, and and years. And so, uh, do you feel like uh, you know? The, Songkick actually showed a chart uh, where they were looking at, you know, where bands were touring maybe like five to ten years back. 
and looking at where they tour today, uh, like uh, sort of in, in a graph, uh, it really shows how much the touring market in Australia as well has grown and how much more bands are willing to travel out to Singapore, to Asia, to, uh, you know, in the, from Indonesia to the Philippines. Uh, and, and the, you know, there's a lot more uh, stadium acts as well that, that decide to make yeah. that track and go and, and, and tour there. So uh, do you feel like there is, you know, more awareness uh, on, on the live front of, of where bands are supposed to go these days? Or is it still yeah. like a bit of a black hole as to uh, where they can ensure that they have enough of a fan base to actually make the trip and, 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 and make it worthwhile? Yeah, look, I don't, yeah, it's definitely, um, yeah, it was sort of a little bit uncharted there for a little while and they probably didn't know exactly where to go or what to do. But look, I think festivals have definitely opened that up a little bit. Um, yeah. You know what I mean? There's, there's, there's so many of those probably in every territory, particularly. I mean, I definitely in here, here in Australia, there seems, <laughs> there seems to be a whole bunch every year, every, um, year come along. But look, I think that's definitely opened thing up, things up and, you know, some of these promoters are looking to... to to bring bands in, I mean, even Ballyarm Digital as a company, we're we're even looking to do that and bring some of the acts from Asia into Australia. I mean, there's, there's enough expats in uh, in the country to to sort of fill reasonable size venues, and sort of when we pitch that idea out, they generally want to do some sort of, you know, um, I mean, they, they'd like to bring to do the same. So it becomes like a bit of an exchange program. Sure. And um, yeah, look, you know, definitely. Definitely, yeah. And uh, Neil, uh, on the on the festival front, uh, how how are those uh, performing in developing territories as opposed to, uh, you know, somewhere like you know, for example, Singapore or Australia that is is, is more economically advanced, for example. I guess the, the festival that I'm closest to that I know most about is the uh, Java Jazz in Indonesia. So we have Java Jazz, Java Rocks. Um, that's very well established. That that gets uh, that's sold out each. Um, well, they have four of those a year. Uh -huh. uh, in uh, in China, they've got a lot. They they've got music conferences actually. So music conferences are where bands can go and play and be highlighted. Um, I'm not to to be honest. I'm I'm not aware of more festivals. Uh, Marie might be. Marie is resident in Singapore. I'm just visiting Manila. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. Marie? Yeah, there's more and more festivals in uh, in every country. There's uh, local promoters organi organizing, like for example, uh, recently uh, Wonderland in uh, in Manila. So they brought like three or four big acts, like uh, uh, Neon Tree and Nada Surf, and then local acts. Uh, there's a lot of uh, Australian promoters that, that expand out of Australia. Uh, for example, Future Music in, uh, in Malaysia or Laneway Festival in Singapore. Um, so there's a mix of both uh, local promoters, inter international promoters. And it's a bit like the new, the new trend in a way because yeah. it makes people... I mean, peop the, the audience will buy a ticket for a bunch of bands so they, they won't take too much risks. Uh, rather than just buying um, a, a ticket for one one act that yeah. might that might they might be disappointed. So because uh, I mean in Singapore, but I think in the other countries as well, um, the public has to be reassured that it's going to be a great gig and they're going to like the music. Otherwise, they don't want to um, they don't want to be too surprised. They they want to see something that they, they they know that the media talk about and and their friends talk about. Yeah. And so yeah, we are not in a too much in a discovery mood for the moment, but it might come. But uh, so the events shouldn't be too independent or too indie music because yeah that, that would be always the same crowds but slight, there's a slight change because like two years ago when i arrived in singapore there was only a few a, a few events per, per month and now it's like almost every day there's something else so local acts or international acts and this the public is following so that's that's a the big that's a big change that's great that's great. And, and Neil, talking about uh, support structures as well. I was, I was, uh, you know, we all know about the stories about, you know, Korea's, for example, uh, uh, K-pop factory where they have, you know, a lot of bands that are being developed at the same time, and a lot of support is being given uh, to these bands. Uh, when when you look at different uh, uh, territories like the Philippines, for example, you were talking to an independent label. Uh, do you feel like there is uh, some sort of support structure that helps uh, young homegrown artists to? Uh, get some profile and to get some help when they when they need it. Um, for very local artists, as I say, local artists are really the predominant 
style of music in many of these countries, but they tend to be very small infrastructures, as you can appreciate. So bands might play in local uh, venues, whether that's bars or clubs, um, you know, and, and, and they get a, they build up a following, a local following, but it's taking that Lo very local infrastructure, which is very well developed, and expanding it to uh, national and international. And, and and there you've got to say that no, you know, it is it is far more difficult for them to to gain a foothold. Um, Korea has been developing the K-pop um, phenomenon really f over 15 years, and they they really made a decision, a conscious decision. Um, to emulate the the, the, the Western labels, um, and the irony now, of course, is is that they're now selling the uh, the, the music back to us. Um, yeah. I would I would urge anyone to go to uh, JM Entertainment. There are three main K-pop companies. Go to their YouTube channels and listen to the quality of the music and then tell me that Psy was a, a one-off novelty. You know, the, the strength of the music is absolutely phenomenal. So I, I, I think it was really just waiting to happen. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and uh, I was interested actually to, to, to read the declaration of Rob Wells as far as, you know, his placement of universal music and he was placing it more as, as, as a brand than as a label that is competing with other labels. So it was like, you know, he was saying, you know, our competitor now is, is the likes of HBO, for example, you know, the big other big media companies. And uh, it kind of, uh, I was wondering whether you felt uh, as if, you know, uh, you know, for example, they announced uh, uh, recent deals with, uh, you know, in, in, in uh, the Philippines uh, with smart communications and with Zing in Vietnam. And I was wondering if if some of these deals feel more like brand deals, so, so where the, the major label is placing itself as a major uh, entertainment brand rather than a, as a, just a label, and and in that way kind of eclipses uh, other repertoire that uh, you know doesn't manage to get the same deals or the same type of exposure done with the, with major networks. Uh, Matt, do, do you do you ever get that feeling? Yeah, look, yeah, absolutely. I think I think you're right there. It's sort of it's, you wonder what comes first, the brand or what they're trying to um to, to sell. But yeah, I, look, I, I think that's a very valid um, point. Marie, did, how do you feel the independents were placed? Uh, music matters. I know that, for example, Baggers had a presence, and that there were quite a few of the major independents that, that were there. Uh, did, did you feel like the you know they ha they have a voice in the Asian market these days? Mm. Uh, yes, clearly, clearly, and uh, also uh, at the local, uh, on the local scene, uh, almost all the acts are signed by independent la uh, labels, or they're just like unsigned. So the um, so that's um, an, um, I guess the, the the public, the audience is is close to the acts that that are not. I mean, they don't really care about the la labels or what what is signed under this label or this label. It's just a of course, it's a question of marketing and advertisement after that. But yeah, yeah I think like at Music Matters, yeah, a lot of uh, independent labors and companies were, were present. So it's fairly important. Mm. That's great. It's good. Mm. That's great. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and finally, I wanted to talk about, uh, to, to end the show, to talk about piracy, because of course, uh, you know, everybody's uh, still concerned about it. I think there was a, there was a big... Uh, uh, a discussion last night uh, between the I think was it yeah between like one of the the sort of uh, record uh, industry organizations and Google and they were talking about piracy and the evolution of it uh, and, and you know of course people when when people talk about uh, Asia and especially China and, and other territories piracy is something that comes up again and and, and again uh, mm -hmm. and so. Uh, as far as Paris is concerned, I was I, I just wanted to get you a feel from from all three of you. So, w what do you feel is the trend as far as Paris is, is concerned? Are there specific platforms uh, where uh, uh, you know material is exchanged, whether you know peer to peer torrents uh, or you know just hard drive swapping or uh, you know Ill Ill illegal streaming sites that actually host the, host the material themselves? Uh, you know, is there is there a trend in 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 that sense? Mm. Uh, maybe uh, Neil, I'll start with you. Well, I, I don't think it's any worse than, than in the West. I think if you really analyze the figures of how much music is uh, illegal versus legal, I think you'd, you'd come to the conclusion that it, it's like 99.9% .9 illegal. 
um, in the West. So it's it's no worse over here. It can't be by definition. You know, it's all it's 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 so vast. Um, what what you can say though is that from a position of uh, where where most music is pirated, there are now there is now the emergence of legal alternatives. There is a uh, obviously a massive growth in the hardware devices that enable people to play legal music, um, and the two combined uh, would paint a very very rosy picture for uh, for for companies in the future. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Interesting. Uh, Marie, what's your take on that? Um, I, I think the same, and also that new services like uh, the streaming services or download like iTunes, uh, this is quite new here. So um, it takes time for people to get educated and to, to know that it's the way to, to get access to legal music. Um, mm. But yeah, it's, I mean, it's also a question of uh, regulation because there's for the moment there's no real regulation from the, the states. Yeah. So they might. I mean, it is everything related to copyright is is quite like hard to to get through here, like Indonesia or Malaysia. It's 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 really blur and nothing. Nobody really knows what what's going on, and and the artists don't know how to register their music and 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 yeah and and be under copyright yeah. and to get protected. So I mean, it's it's all these questions that have to be also discussed from the I mean the government point of view as well. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, the governments mm. I think are, are a little bit skeptical now just because of the the mixed and the two negative results that. Uh, for example, the three strikes uh, law in in, uh, mm. in Korea has have spurred. You know, we've seen some of the figures that have come out lately, and it doesn't look like mm. it's, it's, it's had much of an effect at all. And uh, it's been implemented a bit a bit mm. strangely. But that's of course the, the nature of of implementing uh, such a wide wide ranging law. Mm. Uh, Matt, in Australia, what, what's the situation now in regards to to government regulation? Is there anything in particular that is being done against piracy? Not particularly. I mean, look, the, everything that's um, about as heavy as they get is everything that seems to filter through from the US. So, if, some, if they make an example of someone in the US for, for you know, downloading a torrent uh, like an album illegally, uh, they'll they'll use that over here. But look, over here, I think uh, it probably goes back to to probably uh, to the price point um, the thing we were talking about earlier. I mean. Now that the streaming services have come in and, and at, at very affordable um, price points, I think that's that's alleviated a lot of the uh, uh, you know a lot of the piracy here. I mean, it, look, the sad thing here, and I guess in, in other parts of the world, is a lot of the a lot of the kids who are sort of you know I guess maybe about fourteen now, uh, music's just always seemed free, and it's probably because they they've worked out how to download torrents or have got older brothers or uncles or whatever doing it. So. Um, you know, keeping the price down so they kind of think, well, it's not too much to get the real deal is, is an important thing. And I think it, here in Australia too, I mean, iTunes on the download level will probably have to watch that. I think we're about the most expensive or second expensive uh, iTunes store in the world. So, and that all came about when um, when the Australian dollar was quite weak. So we, you know, the price went up to match the US, and it yeah. sort of swung around the other way, and they didn't adjust the prices. So, look, you know, I, th I think the retailers are going to have to, uh, to to watch it and make it sort of more affordable, and that that, that may sway things. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm. Uh, well, that's that's great. Uh, well, thanks so much, guys, for uh, being on the show. Uh, I know it was uh, uh, a bit of a struggle because we are in such a different time zones, and especially you, Matthew, are the furthest away. So thanks so much for sticking with us. Uh, and, no, uh, pleasure. Thanks. I would uh, encourage uh, the listeners to uh, go and check out uh, uh, Music Weekly Asia. I will throw the links in the show notes, and also uh, Valley Arm Digital, uh, who uh, provide digital distribution uh, in uh, a lot of Asian territories. So if you're interested in that sort thing you should probably get in touch with one of the guys here and i'm sure they'll have you covered and so uh thanks so much neil thank you uh, thanks so much matt pleasure thank and you and thanks marie thanks a lot thank you and thank you for listening have a great week and until next time and that's all for this week. I really hope you enjoyed the show. Check out digitalmusictrends.com and sign up to the weekly newsletter. 